Hello and welcome back to the Book of Revelation Historicist View. We are Lebanon Springs House and today in part 18, A Sea Monster Rises, we are going to begin to demystify the first beast of the Book of Revelation. But as always, we're going to start by recapping our last video together, part 17, When Two Worlds Collide. In chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, we saw the woman face off against her arch enemy, the dragon. We also learned that when Messiah was resurrected, Satan was banished from heaven. And then the Jews were persecuted as the Roman army flooded into Jerusalem to destroy the temple. Next, we saw the woman or the Yehudim flourishing in that wilderness that we have termed the diaspora where they fled as the dragon turned his attention to a whole empire full of Christians. Now, as I said earlier, we are going to begin to look at the first beast in the book of Revelation, the beast from the sea. And since um, I entitled this video, A Sea Monster Rises, I thought it appropriate to consider the legends of a few sea monsters because mankind really has been fixated upon them for most of history. And according to the um, article from OceanInfo.com, 10 Incredible Sea Monsters from Mythology, we're going to look at just a few of those. They tell us that the Kraken is one of the most famous sea creatures from mythology. It takes the shape of a giant squid in most iterations. It supposedly lives off the coast of Norway and Greenland and terrorizes sailors passing through that area. Some have suggested that the legends of the Kraken originated from sites of giant squid, which can grow to be quite large. And then there's the ever mysterious Siren. They tell us in Greek mythology, Sirens are female creatures who live near the surface of the water. They sing, enchanting passing sailors with their beautiful music, and they draw ships towards the shore where they inevitably crash. Some myths suggest that sirens can even charm the wind. Now the sirens were usually a combination of a woman and various birds, but later in mythology, it was more common to see sirens depicted as sinister mermaids. Now the final example that I'm going to cite today from this website is the sea bishop and it's going to become glaringly obvious why it's named so. They tell us the sea bishop is a legendary fish that was reported to exist in the 16th century. According to legends at the time, it was taken to Poland where the king wished to keep it. The fish was shown to Catholic bishops and made its wishes to be released clear. The bishops acquiesced to its request and let it go. It made the sign of the cross and vanished into the sea, at least as the myth goes. Another specimen was reported in 1531 that refused to eat after its capture and passed away just three days after it was removed from the sea. Now, just in case you're wondering, um, I didn't make this legend up. Really, the internet is full of recorded documentation of this myth. And I'm not suggesting that it's this creature really existed. Remember, my point is really to show mankind's infatuation with mythology. But it does beg the question, which came first, the monster or the myth? In the sense that either fantasy is fabricated upon men's folly or man's folly intimates fantasy. I think this last monster hits a little close to home as we begin to closely examine the beasts of Revelation, beginning with the first beast of chapter 13, the beast from the sea. And now we are ready for the symbolism, beginning with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now this image on the right depicts the beast of Revelation. Verse 1 merely details the fact of its seven heads and ten horns with their crowns. When we compare this beast with the 
Four Beasts of Daniel and Chapter 7. The similarities are striking. Chapter 7 and verse 3 tells us that there's a lion, a bear, a four-headed leopard, and some such terrible beast as cannot even be described as belonging to the animal kingdom by Daniel. But what Daniel does tell us is that this fourth terrible beast is the fourth kingdom that rules upon the earth. And we know that in hindsight to have been the Roman Empire. Furthermore, in verse 7 of chapter 7, uh, we're told that this is the head or this is the beast that displays the ten horns. Next, we're told that each head of this beast of Revelation has the name of blasphemy upon it. And looking quickly at the Greek word blasphemia, meaning slander, detraction, or speech which is injurious to another's good name, we kind of get a sense of what John is revealing about this beast. And I think it's important to look at the other Greek word suggested here, and that is the word onama, or name, which really means figuratively or literally authority or character. You know, it's going to really line up with the history of this beast maligning or speaking injuriously against the character or authority of God when he blasphemes his name. Next, in verse 2, we see that the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So we see verse 2 is where we find further evidence that Revelation's beast really does represent the beasts that Daniel saw. Here we see the components of a bear, the lion, and a leopard. But more importantly, we're told here what Daniel wasn't told, and that is that these beasts have an authority over them, the dragon, which we remember from our last video to have been identified as Satan. Moving on to verses 3 and 4 and beginning with verse 3, John says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after this beast. I want to use pictures because that's very helpful to clarify what we're really being told here. This, of course, being the first beast of the book of Revelation, and these are Daniel's beasts. It's important to state here again that Daniel himself interprets his beasts for us. So, in other words, this is not historicist conjecture. Daniel tells us that the lion represents Babylon, the bear represents Media Persia, the four-headed leopard is Grisha, and this fourth beastly kingdom was Rome. Well, remember, Daniel couldn't really even name that beast because that kingdom hadn't yet materialized like the other nations that were, at least in some form, present in the time of Daniel. And verse 3, having just told us that one of these heads receives a fatal wound that is healed, well, it points to the final empire, the Roman Empire, as being the head in question. Now, if this sounds like circular reasoning to you, I just want to remind you that the disciples looked to the history, their history, to understand Yeshua's words about the temple being destroyed and then raised up in three days to have met his death and resurrection. They didn't understand that when he was speaking about it, but in hindsight, they said, oh, that's what he meant. So here, too, we can confidently lean on the history of that empire to bear out this prophecy. So we see that the Roman Empire is that fourth beast which received the fatal head wound, but yet is revived. All of this confirming, again, that the head on the beast of, of, the, beast of the sea, which receives the fatal wound, to have been the Roman Empire. And next we read in verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? I want to suggest that this is not trivial information. If we looked at the word worship here in the Greek, it's prasku neo. 
It means to kiss, like a dog licking his master's hand, to fawn or to crouch to, to prostrate oneself in homage. You know, however you look at this, in whatever way you cut it, make no mistake, you are either fighting this beast or you're worshiping it, and thus you're worshiping the dragon who empowers it. And since this beast still exists today, this truth still exists. So it's fairly important. Now looking to verses 5 and 6, we read, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. We're already familiar with the forty-two months and what that represents. This is how long this beast will wield its power. One thousand two hundred and sixty years according to the prophetic principle of time. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And we've already talked about the fact that each head had the name of blasphemy upon him or upon it. And here we see that the mouth now blasphemes the name, the tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It's pretty interesting to me that this beast we read in a previous verse was given a mouth, right? It doesn't say he just spoke this. It says he was given a mouth. And I'm going to suggest here that it's one of these horns which is actually given the mouth to speak. We're, we're going to link this to the little horn of Daniel later on, and I hope it'll become apparent that that is who is actually speaking these blasphemies. But again, let's look closer at these Greek words to get a better sense of the depth, maybe, of the blasphemy going on here. We've seen onama, name, meaning authority or character, and tabernacle is skene, meaning a tent or a tabernacle. Well, actually, in one sense, it's a covering, and that's going to kind of make more sense later in the interpretation part. And then we see uh, the verb skene for dwell. It means to encamp or to reside. And finally, heaven is uranos, the sky or the heaven. Now, these last two words, skenu and uranos, we're going to combine them, or when you combine them, you get the sense of those who dwell in heaven, or at least the idea of the saints, believers in Messiah who have passed on to their eternal abode. We're going to see that it's very interesting how history suggests this beast blasphemed these saints. In fact, we're going to cover in greater detail the blasphemy against God's authority and his tabernacle and these saints in, like I said, more detail when we look at the second beast of Revelation because that's who really gives this image life. And now it's time to unveil, as it were, the interpretation of the first six verses of chapter 13. The beast of the sea, at least according to the historicist view, is the fallen Roman Empire as it is reincarnated as the Holy Roman Empire. And we're going to see in just a bit that there are any number of given possible dates for the 42 months that this beast reigns. But they all fall within the same general time period, ranging between the 6th and the 18th century, totaling 1,260 years. And as I said, we're going to look at a few of those possibilities in just a little bit. Now, as regards the symbolism in verses 1 and 2, remember we were told that this beast rises up from the sea, to which Mr. Albert Barnes says, in the passage before us, John indeed describes no storm or tempest, but the sea itself represents an agitated or unsettled state of things. And we should naturally look for that in the rise of the power here referred to. The civil or secular Roman power rose amidst the agitations of the world and from a state of commotion that might well be represented by the restless ocean. The sea naturally describes a nation or people, for this image is frequently so employed in the scriptures. It is distinguished for bloodthirstiness and cruelty, and thus becomes an emblem of a fierce, tyrannical power. 
In its general character, it resembles a lion, and the lion and the leopard are often referred to together. In this description, it is observable that John has combined in one animal or monster all those which Daniel brought successively on the scene of action as representing different empires. In John, there is one animal representing the Roman power, as if it were made up of all of these. A leopard with the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion with two horns, and with a general description of a fierce monster. There was an obvious propriety in this, says Mr. Barnes, in speaking of the Roman power, for it was in fact made up of the empires represented by the other symbols in Daniel and combined in itself all the elements of the terrible and the oppressive, which had existed in the aggregate in the other great empires that preceded it. Satan claimed, he says in the time of the Savior, all power over the kingdoms of the world, and asserted that he could give them to whomsoever he pleased. It cannot be doubted that the Roman power seemed to have such an origin, and on that supposition, it would be. In its arrogance and haughtiness, in its thirst for dominion, in its persecutions, it had such characteristics as we may suppose Satan would originate. If therefore, as the whole connection leads us to suppose, this refers to the Roman secular power, considered as the support of the papacy, there is the most evident propriety in the representation. Now next I want to look at Adam Clark in his commentary. He says the beast here described is the Latin Empire which supported the Romish or Latin Church. As the phrases Latin Church and Latin Empire, he says, are not very generally understood at present, and of course he's speaking in his time period, how, how much less are they understood today? He says it will not be improper here to explain them. During the period from the division of the Roman Empire into those of the East and West, until the final dissolution of that Western Empire, the subjects of both empires were equally known by the name of Romans. Soon after this event, the people of the West lost almost entirely the name of Romans and were denominated after their respective kingdoms, which were established upon the ruins of the Western Empire. And this is a good point to remind you that in 476 AD, when the Western Roman Empire fell, remember that was due to the infiltration of the quote unquote barbarians who were really just peoples, you know, people groups flooding into that kingdom through migration. In fact, remember there were exactly 10 kingdoms that came into being at that time according to their tribal denominations. And it's out of this whistling tea kettle that the Holy Roman Empire arose. Mr. Clark continues, But as the Eastern Empire escaped the ruin which fell upon the Western, the subjects of the former, that is the Eastern Roman Empire, still retained the name of Romans and called their dominion the Roman Empire, by which name this monarchy was known among them until its final dissolution in 1453 by Muhammad II, the Turkish Sultan. Here Mr. Clark is referring to the sixth trumpet whereby Constantinople fell with gunpowder and cannonry. We remember that very well. He says, but the subjects of the Eastern Empire or Emperor ever since the time of Charlemagne or before called the Western people or those under the influence of the Romish church Latins or their church the Latin Church. And the Western people in return denominated the Eastern Church the Greek Church and members of it Greeks. Hence the division of the Christian Church into those of Greek and Latin. So again here he's just telling us that history has been that the Greek Orthodox Church being the um, remnant, if you will, of the Eastern Roman Empire even after it fell in 1453 we still call it the Greek Church today, and up until this time that the 
the Holy Roman Empire began to arise out of the fallen Western Roman Empire, that that became known then as the Latin Church. And you know, that makes sense because we, we see that the Church is going to put the Bible into the Latin uh, so that the people don't really understand it and they have to you know, depend upon the hierarchy of the Church. Let's not forget that the Eastern Roman Empire continued for another thousand years after the Western Roman Empire fell to the barbaric invasions. Uh, but again, as we see the Western half kind of morphing from a collection of ragtag people groups into a more organized entity, we also see the fight for the right to be called Roman. Uh, it's in the forefront of everyone's minds. Why? Because they all wanted its former glory. Not to mention, this wounded beast needs a new host to inhabit. Next we remember that the symbolism in verses 3 and 4 began with this fatal head wound that is healed, to which Mr. Barnes replies, Now as to the leading fact, the decline of the Roman imperial power, the fatal wound inflicted on that by the sword, there can be no doubt. In the time of Augustulus, it had become practically extinct, wounded as it were to death, and so wounded that it would never have been revived again had it not been for some foreign influence. It is true also that when the papacy arose, the necessity was felt of allying itself with some wide extended civil or secular dominion that might be under its own control and that would maintain its spiritual authority. It is true also, says Mr. Barnes, that the empire was revived, the very image or copy, so far as it could be, of the former Roman power in the time of Charlemagne, and that the power which was wielded in what was called the empire was what was in a great measure derived from the papacy and was designed to sustain the papacy and was actually employed for that purpose. Here Mr. Barnes is hinting at an almost symbiotic relationship between the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, which absolutely did exist. We're going to be told later on in chapter 13 that the second beast holds all of the power of the first beast, and in fact, as I said before, gives life to the image of that first beast. Next Mr. Barnes is going to quote Edward Gibbon, the celebrated historian that we have visited, albeit early on in this series. He says, of the rise or restoration of this imperial power in the time and the person of Charlemagne, Mr. Gibbon says, quote, the title of patrician was below the merit and greatness of Charlemagne, and it was only by reviving the Western Empire that they could pay their obligations or secure their establishment. By this decisive measure, they would finally eradicate the claims of the Greeks and from the debasement of a provincial town, the majesty of Rome would be restored. The Latin Christians would be united under a supreme head in their ancient metropolis, and the conquerors of the West would receive their crown from the successors of Peter. The Roman Church would acquire a zealous and respectable advocate. Moving on to who is like this beast, who is able to make war with him? Well, they really serve to secure, I think, the affirmation of this part of the interpretation. Mr. Barnes tells us that this found a fulfillment in the honor shown to the civil authority which sustained the papacy. For the policy was to impress the public mind with the belief that that power was invincible. In fact, it was so regarded. Nothing was able to resist that absolute despotism, and the authority of princes and rulers that were allied with the papal rule was of the most absolute kind, says Mr. Barnes. And the subjugation of the world was complete. There was no civil, as there was no religious liberty. And the whole arrangement was so ordered as to subdue the world to an absolute and uncontrollable power. Wow, these are both weighty accusations and monumental proofs that can be found in history to back this view. 
Next, we remember in verses 5 and 6, we saw that the beast was being given a mouth with which he would blaspheme God. And I suggested it was going to be one of these horns uh, of this beast. Remember, this is still an amalgamation. And again, we turn to Mr. Barnes to make these connections for us. The language used here, he says, is the same as we, what we find in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, when speaking of the little horn. In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Well, let's go straight to Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and half a time. Well, you would be hard-pressed, I think, to find anyone who does not connect these verses in Daniel chapter 7, speaking of this little horn, with the Antichrist, or in our current study being connected with the, this beast of Revelation. The transparency is quite brilliant. There's very little ambiguity here. In fact, Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the whole Bible, says, His malice was principally leveled at God in making images of him who is invisible and in worshiping them. As far as the tabernacle of God, that is, say some, at the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, in which God dwells as in a tabernacle, this is dishonored by their doctrine of transubstantiation, which will not allow his body to be a true body, and will put it into the power of every priest to prepare a body for Christ in the Mass. And as far as against those that dwell in heaven, the glorified saints, by putting them into the place of the pagan demons and praying to them, which they are so far from being pleased with that they truly judge themselves wrong and dishonored by it. You know, I can only imagine when I read this uh, of someday Mary saying, you made me mother of whom? Or for that matter, Paul saying, you said I said what? You know, when we elevate men, even godly men, to the level of sanctity that rivals that of our Lord, we do them a great injustice and do hurt our own selves. And finally, on this note of blasphemy, Reformation21.org says, If there is any commandment that is broken more consistently, more habitually, historically, and egregiously by Christians than by non-Christians. It is the third commandment. That's because taking God's name in vain goes a lot farther than saying, Oh my God. What God has in his sights is the abuse and misappropriation of his name, which tends to happen more when you use the name more. In fact, the higher up you go in professional piety, they say, or ecclesiastical authority, the more blasphemy you're going to encounter. I find this word misappropriation very interesting given today's impolitic climate. With all the talk of cultural appropriation being taboo, we have failed to give any credence or thought to how we've misappropriated the attributes of our holy God in so many ways and we fail to see this as deserving condemnation. It's simply staggering. And we're going to look very closely in the next uh, several videos as we look at the second beast in particular, the papacy and the blasphemy that he truly, it truly is guilty of. And verse 5 also told us that the beast was given power to continue for 42 months, and we have said that that is 1,260 years. But let's just quickly review the prophetic formula showing that that is true. 42 months is 1,260 years. According to the principle of prophetic time, he's given 42 months to continue. 
and 42 times 30 day months is 1260 days and if one year is given for each day that is how we account at the 1260 years again that was just a quick recap of that principle because you know maybe someone is just now joining us and if so I hope that you're going to go back to the beginning you've missed an awful lot of good stuff including why this principle from the scripture is here applied so now I mentioned earlier that we would look at several possible time frames for this 42 months we're going to do that now and it's important to keep in mind that the Lord did not give us a beginning date or an end date he only gave us the duration of this beasts rule I'm going to attempt to show that there's plenty of historical evidence which not only matches very well the details of the prophecies but that any one of them is quite plausible and you know we really only have to show that there's sufficient history to recommend this historical view I mean even the futurist view of the book of Revelation they're not looking for an exact start date they're really just looking for events they're watching for events that line up with the prophecies so too then in the historical perspective we're merely looking at the quote-unquote bones in the sand the artifacts of history so beginning with the first theory in 257 AD when deliberate persecution of Christians within the Empire began under Emperor Valerian and intensified in 303 AD under Diocletian remember we covered this in our video on the seal judgments the fifth seal of martyrdom we also remember that this is right before Constantine ascends the throne of Rome which brings about brings about great changes we also discussed how those changes really laid the foundation upon which the beast kingdom is going to build now if we were to add 1260 years to 257 AD we arrive at 1517 AD which we should recognize as the uh, start of the Protestant Reformation in other words the come out of her my people phase of this beast kingdom now another possibility deals with the year 533 AD where in a letter to the Bishop of Rome Emperor Justinian he's Emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire declares the preeminence of the Bishop of Rome over all other bishops and puts the authority to deal with heresy squarely in his hands again adding 1260 years to this date we arrive at 1793 this date is noted for the commencement of the reign of terror in France um, the establishment of the cult of reason which was an attempt to replace Catholicism altogether it will only be a few short years and France the original proponent of the papacy will boot him out altogether another view puts the prophetic 42 months starting in the year 538 AD where some suggest the transition making the pagan Roman Empire officially the Holy Roman Empire occurred Emperor Justinian declared himself no longer the leader of the armed forces but rather a the theologian it does seem clear at this time that he directs his focus to all things religious and presumes himself as Emperor to be the head of the church one might even say this was the progenitor of the marriage of church and state and 42 prophetic months later would bring us to 1798 AD where as I mentioned or alluded to earlier that France's revolution once being the you know stalwart of papal power are going to throw God and religion completely out in exchange for human reasoning I dare say there are other models that we could look at but I'm going to give just one more example in the year 601 AD Pope Gregory the first issued a now famous edict consecrating pagan beliefs and customs which allowed new converts to continue to worship the way they were used to now we mentioned Constantine earlier and remember that's really what he did he kind of threw a broad net and, and made everything in his empire Christian and it didn't really matter 
how you worshiped or what um, rituals you had. They were just declared Christian. And Pope Gregory, we see 300 years later, pretty much doing the same thing in an attempt to make it easy for new converts to become Christian and yet really not have to put forth any fruit to prove that. You know, it is not a difficult task at all to uncover the origins of many of the traditions Christianity holds today, if one desires to consider these things, that is. And I realize many are going to say it doesn't matter how they began because what's important is what they mean now. However, what does it mean to you may be the wrong question to ask. Rather, perhaps we should ask, what does it mean to God? I'm finding that in these last days, many people are finally asking the right questions. And I'll save that for another video. But 1260 years after this edict was issued, the formation of the Italian state began in 1861 AD. The birth of nationalism, beginning with Italy, and it saw the former papal states, including Rome itself, absorbed under uh, the new nation, if you will, of Italy. This stripped the papacy of all temporal power and left it once again as a prisoner in the Vatican. It's not going to be until the Lateran Treaty of 1929, almost 70 years later, before Italy recognizes Vatican City as an autonomous country under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Papacy. Consequently, it'll be the same treaty which secures recognition of the Italian state by the papacy. Now, all these examples hold some merit, and I believe that there's really exactly one which could perfectly answer this question. The fact that we don't know which one it is doesn't shake my faith about this historicist view because if we were to make a timeline between Messiah's first coming and his return and then mark the start and the end of the 42 months, it's pretty apparent, I think, that in those 2,000 plus years, there's plenty of time and there's plenty of material regardless of how we slide this back and forth over that time span. Um, again, it doesn't matter which model we use. There's plenty of time and there's plenty of material. Really, this historicist model is still the best one in my view. And if you've been hoping for a thus saith the Lord, this is when it began and this is when it ends, I'm sorry. To have disappointed you but again only in you know one's mind could anybody really put their finger on that with the historicist and with the futurist view will they really know hey it the hammer just dropped probably not you know if that view is correct and likewise with this historicist model um, we can clearly see there are lots of possibilities now, to quickly summarize these first six verses of chapter 13, the historicist view sees the Holy Roman Empire rising up out of the Sea of Nations, those that conquered the Western Roman Empire. The fatally wounded head of this beast being that Roman Empire, which Daniel's vision confirms undeniably. The healing of said beast being the Holy Roman Empire, which we will be able to fairly prove, I think, in these next several videos regarding chapter 13. We're gonna be diving deep and bringing into focus all of this beast's attributes that up until this point we've only alluded to. We also saw these verses in these verses that this beast is given a mouth to blaspheme God's name, his tabernacle, and his saints. We only briefly covered these symbols here because I believe they're going to be better explained as we look further to the second beast's activity. Remember, I believe this mouth is given by way of the little horn, 
And I believe the little horn, the man of sin, the Antichrist, are all rolled up into the second beast of chapter 13. Just like with Daniel's visions about Media, Persia, and Grisha, first being represented by a bear and a four-headed leopard, and then in his next vision being represented by a ram and a he-goat. So I clearly have no problem in seeing the little horn, the second beast, the man of sin, all of these as being different, again, um, representations of the same entity. Also, the fact that this mouth is being given to this beast, you know, really helping to give credence to the supposed resurrection of this beast. It gives credence to an image, making it appear to have life. Well, this wraps up today's video, and next time on the Book of Revelation, Historicist View, Part 19, In the Belly of the Beast, we're going to look at verses 7 through 10 of chapter 13 and discover how the Holy Roman Empire used its power and authority to wage war on the saints. Now, we've already talked a great deal about this war, and... Um, you know, when we covered chapter 11 on the two witnesses. But this time we're going to focus in on the inquisitions unleashed by this dark empire, which really become an organ of papal government. We're also going to see the promise of its doom. Because, as we will learn, the Holy Roman Empire is neither an empire nor is it holy. The one thing that it is, is Roman. Now remember that statement because that's a hint about both its name and number. Hope you can join me for part 19 in the belly of the beast. Until then, stay well, keep studying to show thyself approved of God, and shalom.